Hey guys, what is up? And today we're going to be taking a look at the attacks currently used to take things offline. If that sounds interesting, then please stick around. We'll be taking a look at various tools and techniques, and more importantly, things that you can do to protect your server against them. But first, a quick thank you to all of the Patreon patrons. Thank you all so much for supporting the videos. If you'd like to become a patron, there is a link in the description below where you can subscribe for only $2 a month. You can get access to the Discord server where you, myself, and other patrons hang out, ask questions, and discuss things together. If you'd like to keep these videos coming out and the personal Discord does sound interesting, then once again, the link is in the description below. All right, let's dive into it. So in this example scenario here, I've got an Ubuntu 18.04 web server, an Ubuntu 18.04 desktop client, and a Kali attacker. Uh, keep in mind, all these systems are fully up to date as of this recording. So I've gone ahead and installed the LAMP stack as per the instructions on the DigitalOcean tutorial, which is the first thing that comes up when searching for instructions on the topic. All this is important because I want to stress that these attack vectors are much easier to obtain and more common than you might think. When I first heard about these, my first thought was that they were possible due to some outdated software or misconfiguration. Um, actually, this is absolutely not the case. All right, so as you can see, when we connect to the web server from the client, we get the default Ubuntu slash Apache 2 web page. Now, very quickly, what do we mean when we say DOS or DDoS? Like, what's the difference between the two? DOS stands for denial of service. Similarly, DDoS stands for distributed denial of service. When we think of denial of service, we generally think of Facebook or YouTube or something similar getting hit and taken down. While this is accurate enough, denial of service can extend far beyond websites or even the internet. Denial of service attacks are a broad category. For example, there's been people who have phoned call centers countless times with an automated system in order to tie up their operators. The key here is in the name, denial of service. A denial of service attack specifically means attacking a service in such a way that other legitimate users are denied that said service. This means that, yeah, you can tie up phone lines or operators, websites, or even water and power lines, and it would all fall under the same denial of service umbrella. Following that same style of naming, the distributed denial of service attack means attacking said service using a distributed network. These are most commonly botnets, but really anything that is more than one attacking machine or network counts. You'll most commonly hear a botnet that is specifically designed to DDoS called a booter. Again, the key is in the name here. Another misconception is that you need a lot of horsepower or network bandwidth to successfully take someone offline. Now, this is absolutely not the case. There are plenty of attack vectors available, and honestly, there's plenty of free tools laying around the internet specifically for this purpose. One final bit of necessary information before we take a look at a real attack here is the network layers. There are currently seven main layers to the internet. When you connect to a website or watch a YouTube video where you're actually utilizing all seven of them. Uh, think of it like a pyramid. I know this looks and sounds super boring, but stay with me for just a moment. I promise it's fast and it's totally worth a look. So why is this important? Because denial of service attacks when used on the internet will take advantage of any or all of them. And it's important to know the distinction before you can properly use the tools or defend against them. Otherwise, you'll just sound like every other skid out there throwing out terms they don't understand to sound cool. The rest of us know what's up. We can definitely tell when you don't know what you're doing, and it's hilarious. Uh, so this network model ranges from layer 1, the physical network, to layer 7, the web application. Layer 1 is just your physical cables and boxes, and layer 7 is the web browser or Apache HTTP server. Most DOS attacks focus on layers 3 through 7, but it is important to remember that cutting the cable is just as effective, if not more, than clogging the pipes with packets. When you see here about Loic, for example, low orbit ion cannon, it's good to remember that it attacks layer 3. If you don't like Loic, you can get a similar effect by simply sending out tons of large ICMP echo requests, which are also called pings. So the Windows XP ping of death, uh, also layer 3. Same with newish IPv6 router advertisement attack, it's all layer 3. Do you want a layer 4 attack? Well, we have you covered. Uh, this is called a sin flood attack or half open attack, though generally newer versions of Linux will hard counter this by default. Well, what about DNS reflection? Uh, those are a bit more complicated since they utilize a layer 7 application, but generally they're considered a layer 3 attack since the point is to flood the pipes. Uh, an ICMP smurf attack is similar. Another effective solution, as described earlier, was cutting the actual cables in the network or hitting the switch of the mallet. That's layer one. I don't know what that poor switch did to you, but, you know, 
still. So today I'm going to demonstrate a layer 3 attack and a layer 7 attack so we can kind of see the difference. The layer 7 attack will actually be the Apache slow get. Um, this is also known as the slow loris attack. And by the way, if you think you're safe from this on Windows IIS, think again. Uh, the IIS is vulnerable to a similar version of this attack, but instead of get, it uses post instead. Alright, so that wasn't so scary, was it? Now that we understand a bit about what's going on, we can actually take a look at what we can do with our Kali machine. So here we're actually going to just ping the uh, Ubuntu server uh, using the just the ICMP ping slash echo. And what we're doing is we're actually making a packet size of 65507. That's actually the maximum allowed ping size for the ping command. And we're going to target it at the 172.16.08. Now what this is going to do is it's going to send 65,515 bytes from us to the actual uh, server itself. The server is going to uh, ingest these sites along its uh, network. Um, since this is a virtual network, it's pretty much unlimited. Um, it's just limited by my own processor speed. But in a real world scenario, this is actually going to uh, use physical networks and it's going to tie up tubes. Um, when you have a lot of these going, it's basically your PC or your network versus the server that you're trying to attack. This will go on forever, and you can have multiple of these. So um, you, you can actually do a, a for loop with this ping command and have like five or six of these running at the same time on a single machine. So if you do this and, you, and your tubes or your bandwidth is bigger than the target's bandwidth or tubes, then you can actually take that service entirely down. So similarly, if you have a couple of computers doing exactly this, that is a DDoS or a distributed denial of service because you're actually distributing a workload across multiple uh, clients here in order to attack the server. Again, it's basically at this point, it's your network versus their network. Um, usually their network wins, not always. Um, if you have, say, for example, a gigabit uh, internet connection versus someone else's uh, poor little uh, you know, DSL box, you're probably going to win. Either way, it's basically a power struggle. And so this is a, a kind of a pure brute force approach to this problem. And it does work, but it's not nuanced and it can tie up tubes that you didn't expect. Uh, for example, it can actually completely tie up the ISP's tubes or it can um, completely tie up, you know, uh, networks around that person basically so you can end up attacking other people or other servers rather than the your intended target or you can tie up your own tubes um, it's entirely possible to take your own self offline using the same attack so it's kind of inefficient in in some ways so what we're going to do is we're going to actually stop this attack and we're going to try another method in order to uh, take this server offline all right, so what we're going to do now is we're actually going to uh, do the slow loris attack against this Apache server. So what we're actually doing in this scenario with this uh, H slow HTTP test, this is actually a program that um, allows us to do various attacks against web servers, various layer 7 attacks against web servers, um, in order to uh, either test them, take them down. You know, basically we're, we're pretending to be the attacker here. So what we're actually doing here is normally when you have a web server, what ends up happening first is that your web browser sends a get request to that server generally. So when you open up google.com, when you open up a web page, um, it will send a request to the server for information. The server then says, okay, uh, I will give you that information and then sends it to the client. This is a normal request. Um, generally, when you make this request, uh, you are supposed to follow a specific structure. You say, I want to connect to this address at this port. And then you say, okay, I want to get this URL from this address. And then you say, I'm going to send a couple of different header things that I want to send to the server. And then I'm going to end each of these lines with a new line. So it's going to be a, you know, a backslash R, backslash N each time. And at the very end of it, is a final, you know, termination sequence. So basically you end up with this, uh, this nice little packet of information that tells the server who you are, what you're requesting and what you want to do with it. And the server says, okay, I'm going to give you all this information. And at the very end of this packet that you send, you send this final termination sequence, this final RN that says, okay, I'm done sending you information now. What slow Loris does is it kind of turns this around a little bit 
it removes the last uh, termination sequence. So it never actually terminates. What ends up happening then is the server ends up waiting for resources. Now, Apache can only serve so many people at a time before it starts uh, either eating memory or whatever have you. Um, each connection is going to take up a resource, and it can only serve so many of these at once. So when you uh, use this attack, what you're doing is you're sending all this information to the server, and the server says, okay, I'm still waiting for that last bit. I'm still waiting for the termination. I'm still waiting for you to say, okay, you're ready to go. Now send me this information back. And so Loris says, I'm going to do this a thousand times over or a hundred thousand times over how many times it takes, but I'm never going to send you the termination sequence and all of these. So the server is going to keep these connections open, but it's going to just wait. So we're going to go ahead and run this and we will see it take our uh, nice little web server offline. So generally this loads pretty quickly. Um, now it is not. <laughs> now, now we've got, ah, now it's uh, taken offline, but... Now we've got, um, yeah, all of a sudden this little web page that took only a second to load earlier is, uh, is taking a very long time indeed. Now sometimes the client will get lucky and actually be able to make it through, but generally they're going to be sitting here waiting for a very long time. And sometimes, sometimes you end up with a, uh, a situation which the client can't connect at all and it just says, nope, refuse, done, and the browser just kind of quits. Um, it really depends on the client, it depends on the implementation, depends on how hard you're hitting it. Um, all these factors come into play, but generally when this happens, you'll notice a lot of slowdown, and ultimately the goal is, with this kind of attack, is to take it offline completely where the uh, user cannot access this page. Now to just very quickly demonstrate that um, we can access this page normally, we're going to cut that and we're just going to refresh, look at that, refresh, refresh, refresh. And we're going to do it one more time here just to uh, you know, ensure that that wasn't indeed a fluke. But um, we've got a whole bunch of connected here and you will see that uh, error in closed rate um, doesn't go down at all. But uh, we've got, yep. And now we've got a, a, a web browser that is waiting for the server to respond because the server is all tied up with all resources that are uh, coming over here. As you can see here that the connection has indeed timed out. So. So this is what the slow loris attack looks like. So now we know what these attacks look like and approximately how they work, but how do we prevent them? Well, the only real way to stop attacks on layers one, two, and three is to have a good hardware host. Normally when you buy machines or VMs, these hosts will provide some form of DDoS protection. The thing they're protecting you from is flood attacks that target layer three and sometimes four. The hosts themselves keep the hardware secure, which prevents layers one and two. Layers 4, 5, and 6 are generally prevented at the OS level. Most Linux server distributions, for example, uh, will come automatically configured to protect against things like SYN flood attacks, but you might want to verify your server and its configuration just in case. At layer 7, it's entirely dependent on your software. Some attacks can be prevented through firewall rules and others through plugins or configuration changes. Uh, for example, if we want to prevent the slow loris attack as we just demonstrated, we can actually create a firewall rule to start dropping or blocking simultaneous connections uh, from an IP address after, say, 30 connections. Or there is an Apache module called Mod Evasive that does the same work for us just on the Apache application layer. Alternatively, there's uh, some mod security rules that you can play with to block this type of attack. Uh, mod security is an Apache module like Mod Evasive, basically. Cloudflare also provides layer 7 attack prevention as well, um, even on their free tier. If you can, I do recommend putting your website behind Cloudflare since they keep up on their updates and security and it's far easier for you. Also, keep up to date on your software and patches because you quite often find exploits available for taking software or even entire servers offline. In fact, a lot of code execution vulnerabilities start with crashing the software or the server itself first. So as you can see, there's many tools available for both the attack and defense sides. It's really easy to get caught up in the up updates and patches, configuration changes and hardware, and it's easy to burn out and just say, I'm done. But really, if you only do just a few basic things to protect your server, uh, you can prevent entire classes of attacks. It all sounds really super scary and difficult, but just by tweaking a few lines of config on a web server, keeping up to date, using a good host, and utilizing the free services like Cloudflare, you can protect your server and yourself from even the most determined attackers. When I was running game servers, we once had an attack from somebody who used a slow loris like technique. It wasn't a web server, but by knowing the signs and looking at the connections, I was able to determine the cause and consequently fix the problem within just a few minutes. 
Uh, it was just a couple of simple firewall rules. Knowing this kind of stuff can absolutely save you. I highly recommend grabbing something like VirtualBox and just trying these exploits yourself. You'll be surprised at what you can learn. As always, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and thank you again to all of those Patreon patrons. Once again, becoming a patron helps keep these videos coming, and all it takes is a simple dollar a month. Like, if you think these videos are worthwhile, please consider simply just buying me a cup of coffee a month. If I see more of that, of course, I'll do more of this, and as always, I'll see you next time.